Great. Um, thanks, Yander. Um, uh, hello, I'm Yansu, and I'm here with Diane. And uh, Diane will keep me in check. So, as an economist, if I don't, uh, if I start not making sense, then Diane will stop me and say, "Hey, what are you saying?" <laughs> okay. I'll try. Okay. So it's a teamwork here. So um, before we go there. This topic is economics of ecological restoration and hazardous fuel reduction treatments. So as you can see, this topic involves two disciplines. So I call myself ecological economist because I'm trying to understand these two disciplines and merge it together. So on the economic side, any policymakers want to know this. Every decision involves trade-offs. So what do we get out of these treatments? So it seems like a fair, simple enough question. So economists should be able to send you a quick answer. But when you look deeper, as you probably all know, nothing is that simple. So ecology 101 is everything is connected to everything else. I guess it's John Muir who said that. So this uh, fire, I, um, I actually did the number of projects on economics of ecological restoration. But when you dig into fire, this is a heck of a complex <laughs> question. So fire, do, if you just uh, look at the physical property of fire itself, it involves these three dimensions, oxygen, heat, and fuel. But if you expand this to fire management, there are a whole lot of other social economic factors you have to consider. So the policymakers want to know this uh, suppression, a uh, trade-off between suppression cost and fuel management. But if, in order to evaluate that trade-off, you have to consider all these other perspectives. So when I start digging this um, field, I see papers that look at this um, phenomenon all as climate change. So uh, climate change is imminent. There is nothing we can do to stop this mega fires. Or some people look at it all as a wui problem, like, you know, if without limiting wui expansion, there is nothing, not, not much we can do to reduce the suppression cost. But in order to really see the whole picture, I think we, there's a whole um, things need to be looked at as a kind of complex but related, a connected system. So, so here's a little piece why this question difficult to answer and why do they persist. So uh, a lot of Public agency policymakers have been asking this question, what do we get out of fuel treatment and how we can do it more economically efficiently. But these questions um, persist because of, I mean, these are partial lists. But first of all, um, this is a, this topic, this first bullet item has been written by the Rideout at Colorado State extensively. The economic relationship between investment and treatment and a reduction in suppression cost is complicated. This is not necessarily something you can compare in the same scale, meaning treatment and suppression is works together to reduce damage or um, the value changes. So, this is, so sometimes people look at this as like if we do more treatment, suppression costs need to go down. Like suppression cost is outcome of these um, fuel treatment. But suppression and treatments are both inputs to reduce wildfire damage. So think about it this way, like if I'm baking a cookie, <laughs> it's, that's an output. Cookie is output and milk and butter are inputs. So milk and butter, that the trade-off between those two is cannot be um, evaluated in very straightforward way. So you know, of course, if you need to bake more cookies, you need more milk and more butter. 
So hopefully you get what I'm saying. So there is the synergic effect of treatments and suppression costs in reducing damage and costs. So this is not direct trade-off um, analysis we can do. So we call that during our workshop, uh, we call that uh, we labeled it as a write-out critic. So that's the name for that now. And so, oh, so um, the, the other reasons, uh, Diane's going to explain, right? Yes. So um, we'll get just briefly here, um, and in a moment we'll get to why we did this study. But um, in particular, as we, we were doing this study, the, the original intent was to try and look at this trade-off from a national scale. And what we found very rapidly is that, and anybody that's involved in this work of treatments and suppression knows that there are many factors that influence um, the cost of treatments, the effectiveness of treatments, and also what's going to influence suppression decisions. So what we found that at the national scale, it's difficult to do this analysis because you have variable topography, geography, fuels, that's, um, that's very clear. In addition, um, fire is inevitable. There's been some assumption by policymakers that really maybe eventually we'll get to very, very, very low suppression costs, but we all know fire is inevitable. And so there is always going to be a baseline need for that suppression that needs to happen. Um, in addition, we're finding uh, this is much more uh, the landscape um, problem that we're facing right now is going to take more work at the landscape scale. Um, that a lot of the decisions we've been making over the last 10 years aren't going to solve the problem of megafire, which is the most costly part of the uh, equation here. And then also policymakers at the federal level have been focused on how will we, we see a return on investment in the federal ledger. And what we have found, of course, is that um, although federal expenditures may be made for treatments and the feds may in fact be responsible for the suppression costs in large part, the damage caused by fire is spread across multiple units of government. It's spread into the private sector. And so what we get for treatments isn't just linked to what we might save in suppression costs. Treatments are much more valuable than uh, just what they reduce in suppression. They create a whole bunch of ecosystem services. And those ecosystem services are spread across a whole bunch of entities that benefit. And then finally, time makes this a very um, nasty problem, too, because as vegetation grows, the, the, uh, basically trying to decide the trade-offs is a constantly moving target. Because um, the more we delay, and we'll get to this a little later in one of the papers that was prepared under this analysis, the more we depart from our ecological condition, the more expensive the problem. So we'll get to our set of complex and persistent questions in a minute. So I guess we present now to you that uh, this is a complicated problem, and there are persistent and burning questions remain unanswered. This bioeconomics, there is so many good metaphors, like burning questions, <laughs> hot button issues, and stuff like that. So I just want to pause for a minute, and I want you to write down your unanswered questions on this topic. I'm just curious. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll have some um, time to discuss um, your question at the end of this presentation. So that was all introduction. So today's presentation will follow this format. We'll talk about um, ERI and evidence-based conservation. ERI is leading. And the persistence question that was identified by policymakers and how that led to wildfire economics workshop that was held in June this year. And then our result is two parts. One is rapid evidence-based assessment to really get at what is the legacy of ecological restoration and hazardous fuel reduction treatment in past 10 years or so. And then the next set of answer is the innovation for answering the persistence question. Persistence question. So introduction, um, I will ask Diane to explain. Those of you that have been in, uh, students of uh, policy over the last 15 years are aware that 
the period of big fires in 2000 really ushered in um, new resources and increased focus on actually using restoration treatments, fuel reduction, as a means to solving the fire risk and suppression problem. That was actually, um, that's a fairly new phenomenon, um, thinking that, in fact, these treatments are going to solve the rising cost of fire. Um, as soon as those resources were increased, the Office of Management and Budget, the Government Accountability Office, and Congress immediately started asking the question, well, what are we going to get for these treatments? Are they effective? And so after um, 10 to 15 years of asking these questions, the Department of Interior, um, and, and let me just say this, there have been numerous reports attempting to answer these questions, both internal to the agencies and external. But um, we were contacted, the Ecological Restoration Institute, in January by the Department uh, of Interior, Office of Wildland Fire, to help um, them look at the answers to these questions that OMB, GAO, and the congress congressional policymakers consistently ask. We were asked because we're a unique institute in that although we're federally authorized, we are a neutral third-party academic institution that can look at these problems. And um, specifically, OMB and Department of Interior wanted somebody outside the federal agencies to take a look at these problems to ensure neutrality. So in order to do that, we assembled a group of um, uh, eminent economists, fire economists in the field, um, to begin to tease this part. So um, here's the list of participants. Um, as you can see, only one person, Krista Gebert, is a federal agency person, and I'm, I really appreciate she coming out for this workshop because she provided this key kind of connection um, to um, you know agency eff efforts. This is not to discount a lot of work, great work that's been done by federal agencies, but DOI wanted a third-party um, review, so we have focused uh, gathering people that's outside the agency. And also, I mean, there are a number of people, experts in this area who couldn't make it to this workshop. So, but I, I'm really um, happy with the works and uh, kind of collaborative synergy we created with this workshop. So, um, and then we will roll out this presentation in the uh, Society of American Foresters Convention next week, and so um, if you can make it to the convention, you will be able to meet um, uh, our team and then more detailed presentation about their specific um, study. And so I just wanted to quickly mention the ERI have a website that gathers all the evidence-based conservation projects, so uh, hopefully this will be helpful for you to look up. So let's just get to the persistent questions. So first question is really, have the past 10 years of hazardous fuel treatment made a difference? And then the next four question is more um, related to what can we do now and what can we do better in the future? So what's the relative value of treatment in the landscape scale? And how can we improve current and future economic return to restoration-based hazardous fuel reduction treatment? And the third quest fourth question is, what is the future going to be like? What are the fuel treatment, wildland, urban interface, and climate change effects on future suppression costs? And really, the last one is kind of summing all up when or will investment in fuel reduction treatment lead to a reduction in suppression cost. And this turned out to be much more complex than we <laughs> originally anticipated, so here's what we did. So the first question is really looking at the legacy of past uh, treatment. We did the rapid evidence-based assessment, and the next four questions, we did, uh, realized that there is some methodological innovation is necessary to answer this question. So rapid evidence-based assessment, this is a um, very standardized procedure. It's, you can see the guideline and then um, a lot of uh, examples in this website here. And so systematic review is a review of clear, clearly formulated questions that use systematic and explicit methods 
to identify, select, and critically appraise relevant research. So it's objective review for to provide a clear answer to management questions. So I feel this is a very appropriate for to evaluate the past and legacy of treatments. So we break down the complexity this way. There are a whole bunch of desired outcomes that we do when uh, we implement treatments. So what is the strategy to get to the desired outcome? Reduced fire hazard, protection of UI, reduce operation cost, uh, improve ecosystem services. And we do ecological restoration and fuel treatments, uh, fuel reduction treatments. So what is characterized as single intervention that get to that? It is thin burn or thin burn treatments. So keeping it simple. So systematic review was actually developed in medical field. So it's very simple. If I give this person an Advil, does the person, does the person feel better? So if intervention applied to population, produce outcome. So in this case, intervention is treatment, and we limit our geographical scope to U.S. Western dry forest, and does it improve ecological social conditions? So our outcome variable includes a whole bunch of stuff, but we selected only those studies that actually evaluated effect of wildfire with and without the treatment. So we found 39 papers. This final tally is still finalized. Um, so we, the final number may change, but we found 39 papers and include 46 relationships. And we classified it because it's an economic perspective. We classify these outcomes of treatment into four categories that's established by Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and that's ecosystem service, classifying ecosystem services into four different services. Supporting services, soil uh, nutrient cycling, uh, soil formation, and it's supporting services that support all the other ecosystem services. And then provisioning services and regulating services and cultural services. So we uh, divide it that way. And so these are the papers we found, so treatment effectiveness in ecosystem services. So benefits, so first of all, regulating services, benefits that are obtained from the regulation of ecosystem processes. So you may or may not agree with this classification, but we include fire risk severe or fire severity reduction in, into regulating services. And then effect on firefighting effectiveness, also we classified under regulating services, and the carbon sequestration. And these are number of uh, relationships we found, and it was all positive. So we can say with confidence that in terms of regulating services, fuel reduction treatment, restoration, we necessarily had to lump that together. So restoration and fuel reduction treatments have a positive effect on uh, regulating services. These are the papers that are not selected uh, in our systematic review per se because we only include those papers with, with and without treatment comparison. But these were past uh, meta studies um, that was done in this field. So this is done by ERI and review of 135 studies and metadata of 54 studies, they found that thinning and or burning treatments do have effect consistent with the restoration of low severity fire behavior. And then the Omni and Matt Martinson study, it was only available as a final report to joint fire science program. So what they found is that the overall mean effect of fuel treatment on fire responses were large and significant, and they go on to show how significant that was. And also there are a lot of fire modeling studies that wasn't included in our system and review 
that evaluated potential changes in wildfire size, burn probabilities, and fire behavior. And I would like to note this Cochrane study in 2012, it just came out early this year, and they uh, looked at past 14 actual fire, and they evaluated what fire size could have been without treatment. So for 11 um, fires, fire size decreased, but for three fires, actually, they found the fire size increased. So their conclusion is that the fire, even a relatively small portion of fuel treatment of a whole landscape, fire behavior, you can change fire behavior and find a fire size significantly. And then this is, this is also the study that just came out um, looking at the carbon balance. And they, this is a five-year five eddy covariance measurement, and they found that catastrophic fire can shift um, uh, Pundar's pine ecosystem from sink to source for at least 15 years compared to relatively short-lived effect of thinning and the fuel treatments. And then next, we looked at supporting services. Supporting services, those that are necessary for the production of all other ecosystem services. And these are the benefits, either in direct and occur over a long, very long time. And so we found a relatively larger data gap on supporting services. And for soil formation and nitrogen recycling, at least there was a one uh, study each uh, found the negative effect on treatment on um, those equestrian services. And then the understory productivity, there were three studies that found the neutral effects. And the, this blue um, numbers indicate the studies that found the positive relationship. And also four studies found the positive impact on biodiversity and wildlife. And also there are papers that are not included uh, in our system of review. And one is economic study and the other one is ecological study. So I'm kind of mixing those two so it can be confusing. But I found this uh, study by John Loomis and others. They did a whole bunch of willingness to, serve, willingness to pay survey on how much people, American public, is willing to pay to reduce fire risk uh, to protect the critical habitat of endangered species. So they came up with this, um, what we call benefit transfer. So with, they came up with this, this simple regression model so you can use it to um, put the number on your fuel treatments. Um, fuel treatments, so the willingness to pay per household is, you know, depends on the number of acres that reduce uh, fire, wildfire risk. And then the next study shows the meta studies on fuel treatment effect on small mammal and pastoral uh, bird species, and they found the positive and neutral effect. So I just want to mention that. And then surprisingly, provisioning service and cultural services, it seems kind of intuitive that um, we lose uh, timber resources um, and recreation resources uh, due to wildfire. But uh, we couldn't find the studies that exactly meet our criteria, but there, I want to mention that there are a lot of studies that talk about wildfire-related losses. These are just examples. And Butley's study in Florida, he compared uh, wildfires to Category 2 hurricane. So timber losses were comparable to Category 2 hurricane. So things like that. And then there are studies that looked at the treatment or wildfire effect on real estate value. So housing prices goes up when uh, the forest is le less denser. This study is looked more toward to scenic beauty. And you know, at least in uh, southwestern Ponderosa Pine, we found there was scenic beauty estimation that psychologically people prefer big trees uh, with a visual penetration. So those things uh, positively impact uh, housing value. These two studies more specifically to uh, fire effect 
on real estate value, and Mueller studies in California and Stetzler studies in Montana. Especially the Stetzler studies, uh, the paper really provides an overview on many non-market studies that's been done in the field. So if you are interested in topic, that would be a good paper to look. And so finally, what is the treatment effectiveness in reducing wild suppre wildfire suppression costs? Surprisingly, there is not that many studies that go directly at that, and there were several papers that pointed out this deficiency. So economic studies that comprehensively evaluate economic efficiency of fuel management at multiple scales are still lacking. Why? We just talked about why the persistent questions persist. And then, you know, in addition to that, there is this um, problem that Butley talked about in one of his uh, paper in 2009, it's always economic jargon, I guess, um, endogeneity. So when you apply fuel treatments, those areas selected is selected for high uh, fire risk. So you cannot really directly get at those areas having more suppression costs is not necessarily um, evidence for ineffective fuel treatment. It's just the area selected for the treatment is selected for high risk of a fire to begin with. So there, there is that selection bias that we need to get at. And then, of course, a lot of people talk about lack of full accounting of ecosystem services. So economists has been making progress. So I want to mention a few uh, recent innovations. And so, you know, I just want to briefly revisit. So we talked about this so far, so we will get to this with the methodological innovation. And this is not our team's work. It's uh, just the uh, agency has been making progress. You know, a lot of reports before 2005 talks about how federal fire management is blank check, uncoordinated, and there were a whole bunch of criticism and, you know, Flame Act required cohesive strategy. So there is a whole website dedicated to that. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it. So we are making progress toward to multi-scale wildfire risk assessment with the national trade-off analysis. And this is led by the team in the Forest uh, Service. And also on the other scale, on the project scale, there is RCAD risk and cost analysis tool. This is the analytical procedure required for all collaborative forest landscape restoration program. And this is a very standardized uh, procedure. So Krista Gieber's team will facilitate this. So, you know, the collaboratives with less uh, technical expertise can still go do this procedure effectively. And so it's basically doing the fire modeling and try to project uh, fire size before and after the treatment. And then Krista uh, built this regression model termed the stratified cost index. So you can look up how, what the suppression cost would be before and, without, before and after treatment. And this is a, uh, published, I, I think this paper is just coming out in Journal of Forestry. You can look that up, uh, the Dushu's pilot study. Also, this website has a whole manual and other information. And I just add, um, going back to our introduction, the work that RCAT will do sp specific to the CFLRP pilots um, is, is at a better scale for actually doing this trade-off analysis because um, the many variables that we discussed in the beginning are uh, much more simplified. Okay, so we will talk about the work that's uh, been done by the workshop participants. So the first question was what is the relative value of treatment uh, programs at the landscape scale? And this will be um, Doug's uh, upcoming paper. And so we remember we talked about write out critique that these um, suppression and the treatments are integrated. Uh, we need to look at the synergic effect. And also we need to talk the total value of, we cannot really wait 
to come up with total value of ecosystem services. So his idea is something very similar. I mean, it's based on uh, something like fire regime condition class. We can look at the relative value of treatments by the treatment's effectiveness on moving this ecosystem closer to desired condition. And desired condition is defined by team of experts who is weighting the so relative um, importance of different um, priorities. So by looking at it that way, we, we don't really have to evaluate economic value of particular ecosystem services because it's a relative value. So there is more detail on this to website, but case studies applied in Colorado, high-level fuel treatment program treatments of about 30% of study sites improve landscape condition by almost 20% over condi current conditions. So in this framework, the treatment effectiveness is comparative. So if you have a several treatments um, alternative, you can evaluate relative effectiveness. Um, not absolute. So this is uh, one of the innovation I, I see as a very good way of overcoming this lack of accounting for total um, economic value. And another work that's been, it's actually ongoing, it's a team from Department of Economics in University of Nevada, Reno, um, Kim Rollins and Mike Tyler. They have, the, they developed this unified analytical model. They're pay, um, they did this for the Great Basin um, sagebrush ecosystem. So uh, they expand this to uh, include the Ponderosa pine ecosystem. So their analytical model is the link economic efficiency with ecological settings. So of course, the efficiency of treatment depends on where ecosystem is. So in other words, the effectiveness is depends on how degraded the ecosystem is. So they um, built, I mean, the, there is, for ecologists among you, probably very familiar with state transition model, but uh, state transition model for Ponderosa pine forest is very complicated, so we have to simplify it. So stylized, the state transition model, we call it. So we include those uh, um, variable, ecological variable, like the transition probability and the effectiveness of fuel treatments of bringing the, the ecosystem back to a healthy state or reference state. And we, um, so they built, not we, they <laughs> did, uh, they simulation model, so they simulated the result effectiveness and the probability of transition in long term. And so what we found so far is that treatments, this may be more counterintuitive, but treatments are more effective in healthier ecosystems. So as the ecosystem gets severely degraded, treatments will be most co more costly and the treatment success rate will be lower. So this kind of gives you the insights that maybe, you know, there is a cost related to delaying ecosystem restoration. So, yeah, yeah, to put it in blunt policy terms, um, the, the longer we wait to get on the problem, the bigger the cost of solving it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to moving ecological uh, condition to a desired condition. And then another interesting thing is we looked at the past wildfire suppression cost and well, you may disagree, but treatment, ecological, at least the ecological restoration treatment, the goal may not be reducing fire size or reducing fire, number of fire occurrence. That's uh, what Diane talked about, inevitability. So if the treatment doesn't reduce fire size and uh, reduce fire severity, does that translate into fire suppression cost? That's really the key question that I, I'm very interested in looking into. So in that case, if, um, if that doesn't change, 
fire treatment may actually promote more moderate and low severity fire, and then the operation cost may go up. So this is an interesting thing to think about. And then um, the final study is looking at the future. This is done by John Yoder in Washington State. He spatially temporarily aggregated uh, treatment and fire suppression by county level and look at the effect and preliminary results show that treatment effectiveness on reducing fire suppression cost was limited or mixed. So the answer, George, is still out. And, but what he found concrete um, consistently is that we expansion and the climate change will have an impact on suppression cost and it will likely to go up, which is kind of maybe some of you would go like, oh, Right. <laughs> I, I'd like to inject here too, we have a, at the ERI, Dr. Amy Waltz has been working on an analysis that was requested by um, Jim Hubbard by the U.S. Forest Service who asked us the question, um, when can we expect, he, he basically wanted to know if the priorities the Forest Service is investing in right now are going to change the future of megafire. In other words, are we going to get ahead of the megafire phenomenon? Those large fires that constitute, you know, most of the expenditures and most of the acres burned each year that are burned severely. And what our analysis showed, and we, we did this using the wall of fire as an example, had the wall, prior to the wall of fire had all the um, federal priorities been put in place, which interestingly, the priority expenditures for the last 10 years have been primarily in the WUI. Would that have um, changed the course of the wall of fire? And um, based on our modeling, what we, what we found is that having invested in the WUI was effective for reducing damage in the WUI. But what it didn't do is change the course of megafire from the standpoint that by not investing in the greater landscape, we are going to continue to see megafire because that's where these fires ignite and that's where they blow into the wildland urban interface. So the good news is we're finding this effectiveness in terms of wooey treatments. However, it's not solving the problem of megafire. And that study will be coming out fairly soon. Okay, so I would like to have some time left for discussion, so I will uh, go through this fairly quickly. To sum it up, we need to think about the whole range of values, not just suppression cost, when we evaluate the effectiveness of your treatments. And our evidence-based uh, review show that fuel and restoration treatment improve the value of ecosystem services. And the question, the last remaining burning question, when or will investment in Fuel reduction treatment lead to a reduction in suppression cost. This cannot be answered in conventional trade-off analysis. So we need a new perspective on economics. And there are a number of expert uh, workshop participants and outside uh, working on this problem. And I think it's very promising to look at the relative effectiveness of different management actions instead of trying to estimate the total value changes. So that's one of the promising area. And then we need to really look at the between fire behavior characteristic and suppression cost more closely. And treatment, and this is a really important fact, treatment may be more, most cost effective in the areas of least ecological departure from natural condition. By extension, the return on investment will be lower with delayed restoration action. And uh, okay, so and um, you can, if you can join us for SAF, that would be great. You will be able to meet the authors of this uh, the later studies and ask more questions. So I will close at that and it's time for discussion. Yeah, that's great. I, I really appreciate that's a great presentation and uh, you guys really covered a lot of material in a short time. Um, so I'm going to unmute the participant line. So if you've got a lot of background noise in your office, maybe you can uh, mute it on your end. Um, and while we're giving people a chance to do that, uh, I, I wasn't clear, maybe I missed it somewhere along the line. 
is the evidence-based review already uh, published from ERI? Is that something that's available? So, uh, not the part who I just presented here, but the FLE study, FLE et al. It's a study about um, fuel treatment effectiveness. That study looked at um, uh, all the treatment effectiveness uh, with the actual, compar uh, actual comparison and the modeling studies. That study has been published and it's posted on that website. I just, uh, it was in the PowerPoint, ERI website. And there are a, a bunch of other evidence-based um, studies posted there as well. And we're working on uh, publishing this. This, uh, this work just started this June, so we academics don't work that fast. <laughs> as oh, okay. As so that it might be coming out next year or something. That's sort of the timeline. We're, we're going to have a summary study that is conveyed to the Department of Interior this fall because um, they wanted something that could be uh, entered into discussion, budget discussions for their uh, 2014 budget. So um, we will have a summary document out uh, towards the end of this year. And then the individual academic papers will be uh, destined for journals. Right. The evidence-based analysis that Liz Cayley's did, I would mm -hmm. anticipate also will be published. But we're just not there yet. We were on a hurry-up job because of the, the budget cycle. Not that Congress is, but we were. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Great. Well, so um, if you're on the line, I'm going to call you here. And, um, you can sort of shout out a question or you can type it specifically in the, the chat window. Um, and uh, one, one conversation that was happening in the, in the chat window, I don't know if people want to kind of continue the discussion that was started in the chat window, but it was around the utility of thinking of all this from return on investment, one of the sort of basic questions that, that kicked off this whole set of research is, do we need to think about this on, as a return on investment, or is it kind of part of the function of government to address these bigger problems? So anyone out there um, in cyberspace want to chime in or add to the conversation, please feel free. I, I'm also happy, this is Diane, to comment on that um, statement as well. Please, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, I think it's a great question, and I think one of the uh, things, quite frankly, assembling ecologists and economists around this question is that it, it is, I think, uh, people are incredulous that we have to defend expenditures to, to restore forests and to avoid costs. And um, I, so I, I kind of share that that sort of alarm. However, in the conversations we had with people from the Office of Management and Budget, they are competing to, um, they're competing for budget for the Forest Service and for this activity against virtually every other function of government. And so they have to be able to demonstrate, as they argue for funding, that what that do federal dollar is being spent for competes well and is uh, as important as anything else that the federal government is spending on. And the, and the language, the currency of discussion is money, just to make a small pun there. So um, it, it, when you're trading dollars for dollars, that, that sadly is, is the way we need to enter the argument. I would say also that um, uh, given that role of government, where uh, Paul Sommerfeld has a comment there in the subject line, about the bond issue that we have before Flagstaff voters and the fact that we're getting very positive voter feedback on uh, bonding to uh, enhance the Forest Service budget to be able to get to this work because our water supply here in Flagstaff is dependent upon healthy forests. So I'll stop with that. This is Xander. I, um, while we're waiting for other questions, I can't resist asking whether you've had feedback, sort of initial um, anecdotal feedback from uh, people within the agency on the results, sort of the, the preliminary results of this. And just the, it seems like the take home message is that the evidence-based review says, yes, this has a positive return. Is that 
Um, do you, have you gotten any feedback on that kind of basic um, response to your work? Yes, we um, we did this as a neutral third party, but we did uh, it's protocol to be able to show the agency what what our preliminary results were, and we received positive feedback both on. Um, our findings and also on the methodological innovations that we're looking at in terms of um, assessing the economic value. The work that Doug Rideout did um, really kind of getting us away from thinking we need hard monetary, this contradicts what I said earlier, but hard monetary values and move to a more uh, a monetary relative analysis of moving these uh, as a result of treatments moving towards desired conditions it's really a breakthrough way of thinking about this um, this problem. Don't feel shy. If you have a question, now you can. So, Yen Su, this is Cass, um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about where you think, um, so kind of where you think the big gaps and next steps will be kind of once you're done and, you know, where, 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 where are we going to need to go next? Um, well, there are uh, many areas that we need to look at, and, I, you know, I can talk all day about how we need to uh, gather suppression costs and fuel treatment cost data more consistently and the agency needs to have uh, some way of for us academic to look up those data more effectively so we can do our job. So that's important and I'm really interested, actually, how fire suppression, what explains fire suppression cost. And so most of previous studies, I mean, the, the uh, CRISPR study actually looked at the fire severity uh, variable in there, but really the predominant um, variable that really explains fire suppression cost is the fire size and uh, close, how close this fire was to Uwe, and then the proportion of private land inside the fire. So <laughs> there isn't really uh, a lot of studies that looked at what does reducing fire severity do to suppression cost. So suppression cost is not going to go down with treatment if we are, I mean, if the political will is we will suppress the fire no matter what the severity is. So it's kind of a very interesting question. I would like to get more at that. So I think that that's really the step, um, future step that I would like to take. And then the Mike Tyler and Kim Rowland study or something like that that links um, treatment effectiveness to the ecological model, like state transition model, that would be really help us to gain insight to what does it really, I mean, where do we need to really invest money first? It's kind of counterintuitive to, their, I mean, their result was a little more counterintuitive to me, at least, that, you know, treatment may be more cost effective on protecting relatively healthier forests. So it's kind of interesting. So anyway, so that um, would be the next step. And yeah, I guess those two, I, I, and, and you know, Doug Rideout has been doing a lot of work in this field to try and do the kind of landscape planning um, links to economic effectiveness. But it's not, well, Doug's model is more looking at the differences between alternatives, not the total or nothing kind of thing, but economists like to think about the marginal benefits of little more treatments. Is this cost effectiveness? That's always good to know, that, um, that the comparison of different alternatives. So those are really the good things we can expand on. And also there is a excellent book 
that's uh, really expensive. But there's an economics of for, uh, forest disturbance. It's a book that come out of uh, well, editors are all in Forest Service uh, Southern Research Station, and they they've been doing really fantastic work on this wildfire e uh, economics field. But uh, you know, problem is there is a little problem applying their work to Western. Uh, forest because you know it's a lot of data they're using is in Florida where um, prescribed fire costs like twenty six dollar an acre or something like that so there is a little I mean w in the West we think about we need to think about thinning and the utilization of resulting biomass and all that other stuff so anyway I jump in on a on a policy perspective. Um, with where where this this analysis has been very um, telling from from an ecological standpoint is that by focusing on the wooey and and obviously policymakers are very concerned about people and we all should be but by focusing so much attention on the wooey there is a cost to the landscape ecosystem and ecosystem services and um, that focus on the wooey has been you know promoted by Congress and GAO and and OMB as sort of the smartest place for our investment. But what I've been really struck by is that that is not getting us to solving the problem of megafire and some of the ecological research that's indicating we're pushing some of these forest ecosystems to new forest types. Um, that's, that's fascinating. And the other thing is that it's just so glaring. Um, by letting people live in the wildland urban interface, we have really created a a big cost problem, and until and that's not a, unfortunately a federal policy issue. That's a local and state issue. Yeah, that that's really interesting. Thank you both. And it, it, I was thinking, uh, Vicky, sort of similar lines, which is isn't it interesting that it's sort of come down to a cost politically a cost benefit analysis of thinning versus suppression costs. Um, and, and you know the and the complex politics that has forced uh, restoration into the WUI, which you know has a lot to do with the the kind of deal with the environmentalists that was created at the passage of the HFRA. And yeah, um, so I feel like that what's one of the interesting things that could come around here is the the economics and analysis and the ecology and frankly the policy research could really be linked together to kind of start to shed light on some of the kind of interesting political dynamics which are driving our obsession with economics over ecological and social um, impacts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's been a very interesting project. It's a very interdisciplinary project, actually, because you can't tease them apart. Uh, hi, Yansu and Diane. This is Evan Yerpa with the Wilderness Society, and I just want to. Oh, I don't know you. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I have a quick question for you, in that um, fuels reduction treatments and ecological restoration of uh, arid western forests overlap in many of the objectives, but they're not always perfectly aligned. Uh, they seem to align better in southwestern pea pine as opposed to some other dry mix conifer in the western U.S. And uh, they also, fuels reduction treatments and ecological restoration will have different effects on ecosystem services. And I'm wondering if you have any plans to try to tease out any of those differences in the future. That is such a great question because we originally really wanted to be able to look at fuels reduction and uh, restoration treatments because, you know, our, our assumption is that if you do ecological restoration, you're bringing a whole lot more benefits plus getting fuels reduction. But um, we, we didn't go there. Um, there's not a lot of literature on that particular topic, but it would be a fruitful area. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that would be, a, but, um, you know, just to gain the simplicity, we just reduced the question down to, a thin burn, thin or burn treatment does influence. Um, we linked it that way, and we didn't really try to differentiate the treatment objective. But that would be interesting to look at the treatment objectives. You know, management plan probably have all that, and then 
trying to link that to, but the degree of ecological restoration treatment, though. I mean, you know, how would you define full restoration and evaluate the project if that actually implementation met the full restoration treatment? But that's a really interesting area to look at to further tease down to the treatment effectiveness um, specified by the different types of treatment. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, we're just about at an hour, so um, thank all the participants for joining us. Uh, I think it was a really good discussion and, and a great set of presentations. <clears throat> if you need to um, move on with the rest of your day, please feel free. Uh, I think uh, Young Su and, and Diane might stick around for one or two more questions if you have them. Um, but if, if you need to move on, you, you won't disturb us as you leave. And at the end, you'll be asked to fill out a quick survey, and I'll send out a recording uh, for this webinar um, later today or tomorrow. So any last questions? Okay, well, maybe there aren't, and so I'll just uh, thank uh, Young Su and, and Diane once again and uh, encourage everybody on the phone to join us uh, for future webinars. So it was a great time. Thanks, everybody. And I'm, with that, I'm going to turn off the phone line and shut down the webinar system. Thank yeah, thank you, Xander. Thanks, everybody.